All right, before Cheryl comes up, I just wanted to introduce her for those of you who don't know you know her. I think you know yourself. Um, so Cheryl Marshall, how many of you have heard of Cheryl Marshall before this weekend? Okay. It's like everybody in my small group. We read her book this year. <laughs> So they have to know her. Um, so Cheryl Marshall um, lives in Texas. She's married to Philip, and he is a Hebrew professor at TES. Kind of cool. Um, so they, he is also a pastor at Founders Baptist, which if you were here this morning, you heard Omri talk about Founders Baptist. That is um, Richard Caldwell's church, and that's where John and April currently go. So it's kind of a fun connection there. Um, so she is the women's ministry leader there at Founders Baptist. And um, she has had many years of experience discipling women. Um, and she co-wrote the book, which is the theme of this weekend, When Words Matter Most, uh, which, quick plug, it will be for sale for a very cheap price this weekend. You can't get it on Amazon for this. Um, at the There's a table like mm, near the bathrooms. And you can buy the book for eleven dollars it's a steal um <clears throat> there's a little like piece of paper on there that says the hours of the book table don't just take the book please um and and you can go and buy the book there will be someone there check credit card cash i guess so um you can pay for that so cheryl anyways she she wrote this book and i heard her speak about on this topic um last year, like last spring, almost like a year and a half ago, my mom's church had had her come and um, I went and listened and I was like, oh, GBC people are going to love this. So that is why my small group read her book and that is why she's here this weekend. So I'm so, so thankful. Um, Cheryl, we're super thankful that you're here. I haven't actually seen her yet, but I'm assuming she's here. I think she's here. Maybe. She's probably getting all mic'd up and stuff. Oh, yay. I'm so happy to see you, Cheryl. <laughs> I'm so thankful you're here. So Cheryl is going to come and teach us. And I just want to make sure you get all settled and comfortable here. Yeah. Let us know what works Thank for you. you. I think I'll sit I've or stand. better, so I think I'll be fine without the, okay. um, Great. Without the chair. So Cheryl had a back injury, so we're like doubly thankful that she's here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Look what the cat brought in. <laughs> and United, and American, and the Yates. <laughs> oh, usually I um, don't come in <laughs> like this. And I've had a chance to say hello to some of you and um, build a little bit of rapport. But I can't do that tonight, so hopefully this weekend, um, tonight and tomorrow, I will be able to meet many of you and be able to say hello and just um, enjoy our time together. I do want to start off by saying I am very thankful that um, your planning team invited me to be your guest this weekend. It is no, no small thing for me to come here and to share with you. I know it's a privilege and um, something that I take very seriously, and yet I hope we can laugh a little bit tonight as well. Before we, before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being our good God who has his plans. We make our plans, Lord, but you direct our steps you bring your perfect will to pass. We see that in the whole of scripture, but each of us here could, to, could attest to that for our own lives as well, and the details of our lives, the details of those who drove here this evening, the, in, in my life, Lord, here, flying. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll just give me a clear mind and a strong body I pray for my dear friends here, my sisters in the Lord, that you will help them also to focus and to listen and to receive from you. For I know many of them have come from a very busy or a trying day as well. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for our Savior by whom we receive it. And Lord, I pray for all of us now that this will be a time in which you are glorified and 
that uh, it will bear much fruit in all of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we are considering God's call for each of us in the body of Christ to speak the truth in love. And I would like you to please turn to Ephesians 4 in your Bibles, and we will be looking at that passage together in a few minutes. But I would like to begin by telling you a story of when truth was not spoken well into my life. You might think I'd start with the story of something that happened really well. Well, this is a moment that it didn't go so well. I was 34 weeks pregnant with our twins. And just to let you know, they are fine. Afterwards, usually ladies are like, how are the twins? They are fine. They, of course, are now 18 because this was 18 years ago. And they are heading off to college at the end of this month. So everyone's good. But I was 34 weeks pregnant with twins, and I went to the doctor for a regular appointment. They were doing a lot of ultrasounds just because I had two. And my mother came with me, and my husband came with me, and the woman, the technician, did the ultrasound, but she was very quiet while she was doing it. And then she left the room. And a few moments she came, a few moments later, she came back. Let me just say, if I stumble over my words a bit tonight, you'll just have grace with me just because of my day. <laughs> we can just pray that my mind works well. Okay, so uh, the technician, she came back in, and she said, Cheryl, I don't want you to eat anything. Well, what does that mean when a doctor or a medical professional says don't eat anything? It means surgery. And so I immediately knew, oh my word, they want to do a cesarean. And that was the case. And so they said, yes, we need to do this. And the doctor decided we need to do this right away. So I thought I was healthy. As far as I could tell, the babies were healthy. But they got me all prepped to go into surgery. And they also prepped my husband. They put on the garb that he needed to wear in the operating room. And they brought him in on a stool right next to me. So our heads were very close to one another. And in the midst of that, it was like I was in the twilight zone. This wasn't supposed to be happening. We weren't prepared. No cribs, no diapers. This was before you had um, cameras on your phones, so we didn't have a camera. And in the midst of that, I looked at my husband and I said, Philip, tell me something about Jesus. And I saw a look on his face I'd never seen before, and I have not seen it since. The poor man had nothing. <laughs> it was a blank face. Now, to put this into context, at the time, my husband was a doctoral student in seminary. <laughs> and he knew his Bible forward and back in multiple languages. In addition to that, he was also one of the elders at our church. And his job is to help people with the scriptures. <laughs> But my poor husband had nothing. And I looked back up at the lights, just like those. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, my husband is in the middle of this with me. At about that moment, I heard my husband say this about this fast. No temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That was the only thing he could think of. <laughs> and though he tried, I must say, he did miss the mark. <laughs> My husband was at a loss for words. Have you ever been at a loss for words? I have. Have you ever wondered what to say to a loved one who is going through a hard time? Have you been aware of her spiritual need, but you haven't known how to address it? Have you wanted to say something helpful and something biblical, but you haven't known exactly what to say? Maybe you even now find yourself like my husband. You want to be spiritually helpful to someone you care about, but you may be uncertain about what to say and how to say it. So who is that person in your life right now? I want you to take a moment and think of 
a Christian, particularly someone within the family of God, who you know and you love, but she is struggling in her heart and she is struggling in her circumstances. Who is that person? What is she going through? What is her spiritual struggle as far as you can tell? Is she worried? Is she just racked with anxiety? Is she weary? Is she exhausted under the burdens that she carries? Is your friend wayward? Maybe you know she's going down a road that she should not be going down. Or maybe she's weeping. Maybe she has recently experienced a significant loss and now she is drowning under sorrow. There are certainly times for us to be quiet, to listen, to pray, to serve, to give a hug, but there are definitely times for us to speak, times for us to give biblical hope and biblical encouragement, comfort, and maybe even some correction. When the people we care about are struggling spiritually, they need someone who will love them enough to have conversations with them that are rooted in and saturated with biblical truth. Why? Well, the answer is found in Psalm 19, 7 through 8, 19 verses 7 through 8. Notice what God's word does as I read this. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. When we and those we love are burdened with worry or weariness, sin or sorrow, we have a choice to either build our lives on the rock of God's word or the sand of human wisdom. And that choice has very real consequences. If we build our lives on God's word, we receive what Psalm 19 talks about. God revives us, he restores us, he mends us. He gives us wisdom, he brings joy, and he provides that much needed understanding for life. But if we build our lives on human wisdom, the result is spiritual immaturity and weakness, spiritual instability, and I would even say danger. And so my goal this weekend is very simple. I want to encourage you and to help equip you to speak biblical truth with grace into the lives of those you love according to their need. So throughout the New Testament, we are repeatedly instructed to use our words and our conversations to promote our mutual spiritual growth. And Paul made this especially clear in Ephesians 4, verse 15, when he said, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And I'd like us to read this verse in its context in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. Starting with verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In this passage of scripture, God calls each of us to speak the truth in love to one another. And as we look carefully at this passage, we will gain an understanding of the great significance that God places on each of us speaking his truth. 
And so the first thing I want you to see from this passage is that God gives us pastors for the building up of the church. In Matthew 16, 18, Christ said, I will build my church. And the primary way he does that is through the proclamation of the gospel and through the proclamation of the scriptures. And so God has given the church gifted men to proclaim, to teach, and to preach. And in our particular context, we have pastors and we have elders. And their role is to shepherd the flock. And maybe you've heard that terminology before, shepherd the flock. Well, what exactly does that mean? That means that they are to care for the spiritual welfare of a local congregation by teaching those believers to know, understand, and apply God's word to their lives. The role or responsibility of pastors and teachers is not to do all the work of the ministry in a church. You know that would be impossible, whether it were a church of 30 people or a church of 30,000. The pastors and elders can't do all the ministry and so they train and they prepare us, the congregation, through the preaching and teaching of the word so that we can then minister to one another, both by serving, but as we are going to be seeing this weekend, also by speaking. They equip us to be the hands, the feet, and even the voice of Christ to one another. Our role then is to build up the body of Christ, to build up the church by ministering to one another. Now, building up involves developing another person's life through acts and words of love and encouragement. It is God's purpose for each of us to participate and contribute to the spiritual health and edification of the body of Christ by serving and speaking to one another. And Peter made that especially clear in 1 Peter 4.11, where he wrote this, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified in Jesus Christ. And so the ultimate goal in the church is that God is glorified in Christ as we speak and serve one another within the church as we have been equipped by the pastors he has given us and so our ultimate aim together is that god receives glory and honor the second thing we see in this passage is that god gives purposes for the building up of the church and i like to think of these as three goals for christian relationships or three goals for christian friendships and we find them in verse 13 until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, as we walk through these three goals, I want you to think again of that Christian in your life who is struggling spiritually. And I want you to consider how these goals, given in Scripture, can shape and impact how you relate to her. How can they influence your attitude toward her or your behavior and especially your conversations with her? How can you be building up her up with words according to these goals? Now, I just wanna make a quick side note. I understand that the things we're gonna be talking about here can also apply to your relationships with the men in your life, your fathers, your sons, brothers, husbands, friends. But for the sake of ease, I'm just going to be talking about our relationships as women. So number one, first goal, unity of the faith. So our first goal for building up one another is to be unified in our common faith. In this passage, faith does not mean one's individual subjective experience or um, response of belief toward God, such as what we would find in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Rather, here the word faith means the doctrines and the teachings of Scripture. An example of that is found in Acts 6.7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, 
and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the body of biblical truth. And so as believers, we are to help one another to be in agreement with the teachings of scripture. We are to help one another know and understand and apply the scriptures to life. And as our lives are brought into unity with the scriptures, then we will grow in unity with one another. It's like when I was in high school and I was on the drill team. And of course, our thing was that we would do these routines at halftime for the basketball game or for the football game. And during the week, we would learn our routine. And in order for us to not look like a herd of cats at halftime, we would have to have some sort of common reference point. So as we learned our routines, maybe it was a line down the middle of the field, or maybe we kept our eye on the uh, team captain and made sure that we were all lined up proportionally to her. And when we did that, then we had a really cool performance and everybody cheered and we were all like, yeah, we're great, you know. So we had to have that common reference point. In the same way, we will attain the unity of the faith when we as individuals line up with the common reference point of God's word and then encourage one another to do the same. The truth of scripture must be prioritized in our relationships as we learn, discuss, and live out God's truth together. We must encourage one another to hold fast to sound doctrine in every circumstance and every season of life. And so I have a few questions for you to go along with this first goal of the unity of the faith in our relationships. First question, are you pursuing your own knowledge and understanding of the scriptures? How can you help your struggling friend to know and understand and apply God's word in her specific situation? Are you encouraging her to hold fast to biblical truth no matter what? Our second goal in our Christian relationships is the knowledge of the Son of God, growing in the knowledge of the Son of God. This means that we are to grow in knowing Christ in a relationship of love and reverence and trust and obedience. Growing in the knowledge of the Son of God is more than merely gaining more information about the facts of his life. Rather, it's growing and experientially knowing Jesus. It's learning to walk with him moment by moment, day by day. Again, as I said, in a relationship of love, reverence, trust, and obedience. To know Christ in this way begins with believing and receiving him as the singular object of your faith and worship. John 1.12 says, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. This word received is an active word. It means to take one for, for oneself, to not reject, ignore, or dismiss, but to receive a person. Are you a child of God? Have you received Jesus Christ as your only hope in life and in death? Have you received him as your Lord and Savior by faith? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the eternal Son of God, born of a virgin, fully God and fully man. He lived a sinless life, but then he died a death on the cross in the place of sinners that he did not deserve. He rose again bodily from the grave, proving his victory over sin and death, and he ascended to heaven where he now reigns on high, and one day he will return as our perfect, righteous judge and king. Jesus came to save his people from their sins, to rescue them from the power of sin in their lives, and also to rescue them from the wrath of God that their sins deserve. Have you put your faith in him and in him alone? Have you turned from your sin and from trusting in yourself to trust in Christ as your savior? Or are you trusting in your good behavior or your good traditions or your good intentions? All of those will miss the mark. 
If you receive Christ by faith in Christ alone, he will forgive your sin and give you eternal life. And the king of glory will receive you. For those of us who know Jesus in this way, we build up one another in him by reminding one another who Christ is and what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us even now. And we encourage one another to love him and to walk with him day by day in faith and obedience. So for example, you may have a believing friend and maybe she carries some guilt or shame from something in her past, maybe a, an affair, an abortion, some form of addiction. Remind her that Jesus paid it all, that her forgiveness in Christ is complete, that she is welcomed by the Father in our Lord Jesus. Maybe you have a friend who is being mistreated at work and she calls you at lunchtime and you know she's crying day after day in that situation. Remind her that her Savior also suffered unjustly and yet he did not revile in return. He entrusted himself to the Father Remind her that Christ understands what she is going through and he will give her grace to endure and he will give her wisdom to make the next choices she needs to make. Maybe you have a friend who is struggling with depression. Encourage her to cling to Christ and his promise that he will never leave her and he will never forsake her even if she's a puddle at the bottom of her closet. Remind her that he loves her and he is with her. And encourage her to take that next step of obedience, whatever it is that day or maybe even for the next five minutes. And so these are my questions for you regarding us pursuing this goal of increasing in the knowledge of the Son of God together. First question, are you growing in your personal knowledge of Christ? Are you maturing in your relationship with him and encouraging your loved one to do the same? Are your conversations helping her to love, reverence, trust, and obey Jesus? Our third goal is the pursuit of Christ-like maturity. Paul describes this goal in Ephesians 4.13 as the pursuit of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God places us in relationships with one another so that we will grow to be more like his son. Christ is the ultimate measure of spiritual and moral perfection. And as we continually submit our lives to him and his word, he works in our lives. He works in our hearts so that we will become more like him in our character, but also in our conduct. Growing in Christ-like maturity is a lifelong process that will not come to completion until we see him face to face. And in the meantime, the Holy Spirit uses various means to grow us. He uses his word and prayer. He uses suffering. He uses the ministries and the ordinances of the church to produce spiritual growth in us. But in his kindness, he also gives us one another. He brings other Christians into our lives to help us forsake sin and to pursue godliness. Who has God used in your life in this way? Maybe it's someone that you can think of right now who is influencing you. Maybe it's someone from decades past, but who is that person? How did she help you grow? I'm quite sure that she gave you some sort of example to follow, but I'm equally sure that in some way she used her words. Her conversations helped you to know and follow Jesus. And that is what you are now to do for someone else. As it says in Hebrews 10, 24, we are to consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. And so these are my questions for this third goal. Are you pursuing Christ-likeness in your own life? Are you purposely putting off sin and putting on godliness? Are you concerned that your struggling friend becomes more like Christ in what she's going through? Maybe that's a question you've never even asked yourself. Are you concerned about her growth in Christ as she goes through her struggle? 
How can you use your words to encourage her to be more like Jesus in her choices and in her conduct and in her character? And so we've seen so far that God gives us pastors, he gives us purposes, and now we see that God gives us, I had to use alliteration, he, God, God gives us a plan for building up the body of Christ. And our part in that plan is simply to speak the truth in love to one another. It's on the heels of these three goals for our Christian relationships that we find this well-known phrase, speaking the truth in love. And so let's look again at verses 14 and 15. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In these verses, Paul explains that the results of building up one another in Christ is that we will no longer be spiritual children. In this passage, children here implies those who are spiritually untaught, unskilled, ignorant, foolish, and immature. And notice in this passage what happens to the spiritually immature. They are tossed to and fro. They are carried about. They lack spiritual stability. They fluctuate in their faith. They are not firmly grounded in wisdom. The spiritually immature are deceived and taken in by false teaching, worldly ideas, error and falsehood about God, about themselves, and about their circumstances. And notice the contrast in these verses. We are no longer to be children, rather we are to grow up. We are no longer to be passively tossed by falsehood. We are purposely to speak and build up one another with truth. And the truth we are to pour into one another's lives is the opposite of what we see in this passage. Instead of every wind of doctrine, we are to give one another stable, sound doctrine. Instead of human cunning, we are to give one another truth that originates from the Lord. Instead of deceitful and erroneous words, we are to give words that are faithful and true. We will all become more spiritually mature and strong in the Lord as we build up one another with the truth of God's word and not the foolishness of the world. And so this is God's plan that we find in Ephesians 4. He gives us pastors and elders who equip us with the word to build up one another. We build up one another with these goals in mind, unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, and Christ-like maturity. We do this by speaking the truth and love to one another. And when each of us does this, Christ makes the body grow. And in all that, God is glorified. And so this is God's grand design for the church on this side of glory. And our part, your part, my part in this divine plan is that we speak the truth in love. And it is a very high and significant calling that we have been given. So I want to shift gears just a little bit and I want us to consider when are we to speak the truth in love? Now we should always strive to have speech that is marked by love and grace and truth and patience. But the scriptures do address specific situations when speaking the truth in love is absolutely necessary, when it is vital. For example, in Galatians 6, 1 through 2, it says this, If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I'd like to draw your attention to that last part. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. This verse, which you will notice is a command, it is not optional, means we are to help one another carry, and what's implied here is with endurance, the spiritual burdens that are just too heavy for someone to carry alone. And when we do that, 
then we are obeying Christ's command for us to love one another as he has loved us. He is our great burden bearer. Now, if we are to love someone well when we help her carry her spiritual burdens, we must understand who she is and the burdens that she carries. We want to give help that is appropriate for her and her spiritual need. We want to give help that actually matches her specific spiritual struggle. It's like when I was in college and there was a day, I was at the master's college actually, and there was a day that I'd um, had a long day of tests or projects, whatever it was, and I came to the end of the day and I was just exhausted. And I don't even think I wanted to go to dinner. I just said, I'm just gonna go up and go to bed and go to sleep. And it was perfect sleeping weather because it was real stormy that day. So I got to my dorm room and I got into my bed and I huddled down under the covers and the rain was hitting the window and I fell fast asleep. Much later that night, I don't know, it could have been 11 o'clock, I don't know, I heard some banging on my door. Actually, it was a lot faster than that. It was more like this. And I got out of bed and I stumbled across the room, very groggy, and I opened the door and there was this girl about my age soaked from head to toe. And she was talking really fast and she was talking really loud and I didn't have a clue what she was saying because I was still half asleep. And finally I looked at her and I just said, I don't know who you are. And with that, she screamed at me <laughs> and she turned around and she ran down the hall and went somewhere, I don't know, because I just turned around and you know, shut the door and fell back into bed and fell back to sleep. Well, the next morning was a sunny day and I got up and I got dressed. I walked across campus to go to breakfast and then I went to a class and then I went to chapel and I was sitting there before the service started and this question came to mind. I wonder where Kathy is sitting this morning. Well, the moment that question came to my mind, I realized, oh, Kathy, was at my door last night. My sister. <laughs> yes, my blood, my flesh and blood sister had been at my door. So I looked around and she was sitting a few rows over and the service started so I couldn't get up and talk to her. Afterwards, of course, I beelined it to her. I'm like, Kathy, I'm so sorry, but what happened last night? She's looking at me like, hmm. And she went on to explain that in the storm, she had been driving um, back to our parents' home and right off campus, if any of you have ever been there, I'm sure it's still there. If you go a little bit beyond campus, there's a turn and a dip in the road. Well, in the storm, it had flooded, and she was driving my parents' big old Crown Victoria. Well, that night, that boat was not gonna float. <laughs> and the car flooded, and this was again before cell phones. So she's sitting there in this turn by herself in the dark, and she thought, my sister will help me. So she ran about a quarter to a third of a mile in the rain to me to get help. And I did not recognize my sister, and so I did not give her the help she needed. Unfortunately, the reality of this scenario plays itself out in the relationships we have within the church. Someone we love needs help bearing her burden but she isn't recognized for who she is, and her burden isn't recognized for who she is. And so then she does not receive the help that she needs. We must be very careful to seek to know and understand those we love and the burdens they carry so that our words will be meaningful and relevant and helpful. And so how are we to do that? Well, of course, God's word gives the answer and that is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. In this short verse, Paul writes this, We urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. In this verse, we find three common difficulties that Christian ex Christians experience, being unruly, growing faint-hearted, and struggling in weakness. This passage teaches us how to respond to one another when we encounter these spiritual burdens. 
So first of all, we are to admonish the unruly. The term unruly here was originally used in a military sense, describing someone who is out of step, out of line, breaking rank. This would have been a soldier who was considered insubordinate and in need of correction. Sometimes those we love may become unruly, making choices which are clearly contrary to the scriptures. Maybe your friend is making choices that are sin issues and direct disobedience to God's word. Maybe she is regularly lashing out at her children in anger. Maybe she is constantly gossiping about someone. Maybe you've learned that she's being dishonest with the family finances or being dishonest at work. Maybe you know that your friend is holding a grudge against someone. She is unwilling to forgive. She is unwilling to be reconciled. When a believer has committed slanderous sin that publicly reproaches the name of Christ or she is characteristically and persistently disobedient in such a way that is destructive to her and those around her, we are to admonish her. Now the word admonish sounds like a very scary word. What do I do with the word admonish? Well, believe it or not, it has a very simple meaning. The word admonish means to put into mind. That makes it a little bit easier to swallow, isn't it? To put into mind. What are some things that you could put into the mind through conversations with your wayward friend? There's a few things you could talk about. Number one, you could put into her mind that her choices are in opposition to the Lord. And when we oppose the Lord, that is sin. Notice I did not say that her choices are in opposition to you. They're not in opposition to your opinions, your preferences, or even your specific applications of a passage of scripture. You are not the issue. You are not the standard. Her savior is, his word is. So take her to that. Show her in the scriptures where she is unruly. Secondly, you can put into her mind that she must turn from her sin to obey Christ and that it's not optional. If she says she is a follower of Christ, encourage her to see that she must then stay true to her word. She must follow Christ. It's not something that we can just say something like this. I'm a follower of Christ and then live however we want. We are to follow our Savior. Thirdly, you can put into her mind that she may experience consequences and discipline from the Lord because of her choices if she does not turn. And you can explain to her that those consequences are not because he hates her, but because he loves her so much and he wants to bring her back. These admonishments or reproofs are never to be given with a harsh, critical, or cruel spirit, but with compassion and genuine concern for her restoration. Assure your loved one that you will walk alongside with her as her relationships are restored to God and to others. Secondly, we are to encourage the faint-hearted. The faint-hearted are the discouraged, these are those who are small-souled or little-spirited. They feel small compared to the burdens they carry and the obstacles they face. Imagine drawing a little stick figure for your friend and then draw a huge mountain ahead of her. Or draw her as a stick figure and draw a huge boulder on her back. She's overwhelmed, anxious, fearful, lacking strength and courage to persevere. The faint-hearted person isn't to be admonished or rebuked. Instead, she needs to be encouraged. She needs someone who will not only listen to her sorrows, but also actively build up her faith. The word translated here as encourage can mean to soothe or to console. With a gentle spirit, come alongside the faint-hearted with words of peace and comfort and trust in God. 
bring consolations to her heart and reinforce her faith with reminders of God's faithfulness and his promises. And I think the most genuine way you can do this is to share with her scriptures and truths that have personally helped you. As it says in 2 Corinthians 1.4, we are to comfort with one another with the comfort God has given to us. You don't need to be some sort of seminary professor who has studied the whole of scripture to be able to encourage your loved one. Share with her what God has used in your own life. What are those passages that have been meaningful to you? For me, it's 2 Corinthians 4. Lamentations 3, Psalm 103. Because when you take her to a passage of scripture that has been meaningful to you, then you can speak to her from the heart. And you can speak to her from experience of God's faithfulness. Remind your friend of biblical truth that she may already know in times of trouble, we all need constant reminders of what we know is true about God. Third, help the weak. When we are weak and weary, we need the loving support of other believers. I love what the Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle once wrote about helping the weak. Our Lord has many weak children in his family, many dull pupils in his school, many raw soldiers in his army, many lame sheep in his flock. Yet he bears with them all and casts none away. Happy is that Christian who has learned to do likewise with his brethren. The weak person is feeble and frail, without strength, either spiritually or morally. And I want to explain that distinction for a moment, being weak spiritually and being weak morally. Spiritually speaking, your friend might be unsteady in her faith. She may be doubting God's word. She may be questioning his character and his promises. For example, you may have a friend who has chronic pain and she questions if God truly loves her. Maybe your friend has sinned and she's repentant, but now she is wondering if she's lost her salvation. Maybe you have a friend who struggles to understand a difficult childhood. She wonders how can God possibly be both sovereign and good? But your friend may be morally weak. She may be ignorant of scripture. She may lack conviction or maturity to obey the Lord. For example, she may be a new believer and she is just unaware of God's will for her purity in her speech or in her conduct. Maybe it's a young wife who struggles to know how to respect her husband. Maybe it's an older friend who in order to just escape the pressures of life, she has now fallen into overeating, substance abuse, maybe excessive shopping. The word translated in this verse as help can indicate holding firmly to someone. It can also indicate supporting from underneath. If you have a friend who you think is in this weak category, quickly reach out to her and hold on to her. Imagine a scene in the, in the movies where a character has fallen off the edge of a cliff and the camera pans onto her hands and you can see them slipping. And then onto her face and you see the angst and the fear. And then the camera pans down to the gulch or the gully below and that's her demise if she were to let go. But what always happens? All of a sudden the hero appears out of nowhere and reaches over the edge quickly and with all his or her might pulls that other person to safety. That is you. That is to be you. If you have a friend who you know is weak and struggling in her weakness, quickly hold on to her. Quickly go to her. Help to pull her to spiritual safety. Be willing to help tether her to God's word in her weakness. Make every effort to help her know and trust God. Provide her with ongoing guidance and accountability as she gains solid footing in her walk with the Lord. As you know, helping the weak requires sacrificial and personal and often long-term involvement. 
She'll need your patience, your friendship, your persistent application of biblical truth to her life as she becomes stronger in her faith and obedience to Christ. Earlier, I asked you to think of a Christian friend or loved one who is struggling spiritually. Do you understand her need? Is she unruly? Then admonish her. Is she faint-hearted? Then encourage her. Is she weak? Then help her. And as Paul says at the end of 1 Thessalonians 5.14, be patient with her. Be long-suffering. Be willing to walk the long road with her. Remember how patient and gracious the Lord has been with you in your sin and in your suffering, and persevere likewise with her. To obey the call to speak, identify your loved one's spiritual burdens, and then bear that burden with her. Come alongside your friend with the truth of God's word according to her need and speak it with much grace. In 2008, my husband and I and our three children moved to Texas from Kentucky. We knew no one in Texas and it proved to be one of the most difficult seasons of my life. Maybe you can identify with some of these things. We had moved multiple times in a few short years and once again, we were far from family and friends. We had three-year-old twins and I was homeschooling an eight-year-old boy and that should say enough right there. I was exhausted. <laughs> we had financial strains, we had concerns, grave concerns for extended family, and I was overwhelmed by these things. We had not yet found a local church, and I had not shared with others at a distance what was going on in my life, and so I was very lonely. I became very discontent, and I was despairing, and I found myself crying day after day. One afternoon, I was still in my pajamas, and tears were streaming down my face again, and I was standing in the middle of our bedroom, and my husband said to me, Cheryl, you know what your problem is. There's no one speaking truth into your life. And he was right. I had become isolated from the people of God. And yet, as he always is, God was very gracious. And over the next few months, he brought three women into my life. Dee Dee, who I just spoke to on the phone this afternoon in the airport, and Leanna and Rebecca. None of these women formally discipled me. None of them opened up a Bible study book or the word of God like this. But each of them spoke so freely about the Lord and so freely of scripture that their friendships made a huge impact on me. As they spoke of the Lord and his word in their lives, God used Didi to restore my hope and my joy. And she still made me laugh today. Through Leanna, he helped me to grow in wisdom and compassion for others. And in Rebecca, he gave me a real life example of what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. I share this with you because I want you to understand that Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 are not theoretical. They are extremely practical. When you wisely and graciously speak the truth of God's word to someone you care about, according to her need, Christ is doing his work through you. He is changing a life through you. He is loving someone through you. Christ is using your words and your care to grow and strengthen that child who is so precious to him. And in so doing, he is building up the whole church in love. I'd like to close with a short passage from the book, When Words Matter Most, to encourage and challenge you as you reflect on God's call for you to speak the truth in love. You've been placed by God in a sphere of influence that is uniquely yours. No other believer has the exact same relationships that you do. 
the Lord has created a beautiful, intricate tapestry of relationships within his church, and you are part of that grand design. Like a master weaver, the Lord has woven you into a particular place, at a particular time, for particular reasons, with particular people. It doesn't matter if your sphere of influence is large or small, seen or unseen. What matters is that you be faithful to God's calling to speak truth with grace right where you are with the people he has placed in your life. You and your words are significant and necessary for the building up of his church. Take a moment to think about your unique sphere of influence. Which names and faces come to mind? Let's pray. Before I pray for us, I'm just going to give you a few moments to pray silently, just to give you a few moments to reflect on what you heard tonight that encouraged or challenged you, and also to give you a moment to pray for that loved one who you have thought of. Maybe there's one, two, or three people that have been placed on your heart this evening. I'll just give you a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your strength is perfected in our weakness. I thank you for the strength you have given for this hour. And Lord, we um, confess to you that with all that we heard tonight, we, we can see our own areas of weakness, areas that we need to grow and be strengthened in loving one another well by speaking truth and love. And so, Lord, I pray your blessing upon each woman here tonight, that you will give her much grace and power and strength and wisdom to, in some way, live out what we have heard tonight. Lord, we thank you that you give us your perfect word, but you also give us your Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. We pray that you will do that. In Jesus' name, amen.